thanks everyone for uh, for uh, coming to this uh, this seminar, our cryosphere seminar. Uh, and of course, we always every week we try to do a little something different, right? We do physical science sometimes, social science sometimes, and today we really have something different. And I think it's a very special treat. And I think this is really going to you're really going to like this. It's going to be very interesting. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Carrie Kepping and Andrea Sparrow. I think well in, in my uh, in my array they're uh, one comma three and four, but uh, they're going to tell us about the Arctic Arts. Project A Voice for Science. So with that, I'll give you to the uh, virtual podium and take it from here. Excellent. Well, let me see if I can share the screen properly. And can you guys see that? Looks great. Okay. All right, Carrie. All there right, go. here we go. Well, welcome everybody. It's great to see so many people engaged and uh, we'll try and do a Zoom meeting justice. Um, my name is Carrie Kepping and this is Andrea Sparrow as well. And we represent the Arctic Arts Project. Um, we're a group of internationally acclaimed visual communicators dedicated to the documenting of science of climate change in the Arctic and around the planet. And our mission is to bring to life the scientific research that you all work so hard to do. Uh, sharing this work in layman's terms and putting it in a visual context makes it accessible to the people all over the world and expands their understanding of what's really happening on our planet. It is this intersection between art and science that inspires and motivates our team. And we are thrilled by the process of researching and locating and documenting the phenomena you work so hard to quantify. We currently live in a world where visual literacy is a standard and there are more cell phones on the planet than there are people with access to running water. And we have first, and we have experienced this firsthand with people living in some of the most remote communities in the world who can tell you the latest entertainment gossip, hottest fashion trends and technologies that they gotta have. Yet most cannot tell you why two trillion gigatons of freshwater melt from the Greenland ice sheet in one season has any relevance to their own lives. So our job is to tell the story of our changing planet. We are not interested in just taking pretty pictures. We and our team are all committed to a much deeper purpose. A powerful story can move people to action. It can bring compassion for someone or something they never knew existed. We seek to inspire change, change in understanding, change in perspective, and change in action. Years ago, an atmospheric scientist asked us to bring back visual evidence from the Arctic that would support his research. I paused for quite a while and then asked, wait a minute, you want me to bring back pictures of air, really? Well, we did, and what has transpired since that moment is quite remarkable. Our team now captures evidence of change in all the earth sciences, from amazing aerial imagery to vast landscapes, down to the tiniest plants and creatures that live among us. One example of what I'm referring to, for most people, understanding the complexity and the enormity of data that is being generated on methane release is not really possible. So throwing 100,000 data points out to an audience and having them grasp what you're talking about is a pretty unrealistic expectation. But to offer a viewer insight into this enormously important aspect of the Arctic system with a few images of say a bubbling bog or a frozen layer of methane gas or an aerial image of vast polygon hummocks is immensely thrilling for each of us. When working in the cryosphere, we tune in to the modern, okay, we just had to jump. So when we're working with the cryosphere, we tune into the hidden storylines within the subject at hand. And we try to communicate that sense back to any of the people seeing that final imagery. There is a deep sense of responsibility in capturing a specific moment in time, knowing that we may be the only person or persons on earth to witness a given subject. 
This is why climate data visualization matters. And this is how we engage the world in the science of climate chaos. COVID put climate on the back burner for most of us last year, but we did manage one expedition to Canada to document, document methane bubbles. And we completed this short film on winter methane that was before virus kept us all home. So watch and enjoy. There may be a little delay there. there we go. Methane, an invisible part of our atmosphere. Methane, like carbon dioxide, is a greenhouse gas. It is far more powerful than carbon dioxide though. Once in the atmosphere, methane traps 84 times as much heat from the sun for the nine years it remains before oxidizing into CO2 and water. We hear a great deal about methane from beef production, oil and gas drilling, and from landfills. This methane is created with human activity. In the Arctic, methane is created in the active layer of permafrost. Permafrost is ground that is frozen all year for at least two years. Some areas of permafrost have remained below freezing for over 700,000 years. In summer, the top layer, known as the active layer, thaws. The organisms that lie dormant in freezing temperatures wake up and begin to digest the organic materials around them, producing methane and carbon dioxide in the process. Where there is water, the soil is warmer. The active layer is deeper and less oxygen is available, making lakes, ponds, and streams more likely to bring methane to the surface. We can't normally see methane, but in winter, as high alpine and arctic lakes freeze, the soil below the lakes is protected from cold by the deep waters, allowing methane production to continue. It flows up through the water and is caught, forming white bubbles in the clear surface of the ice. With colder temperatures, the water freezes to greater depth and layers of these bubbles form creating incredible patterns. Methane is made visible for as long as ice remains on the lakes. In 2019, a study found that with less snowfall or high winds, lake surfaces can be free of snow cover. The scientists who completed the study thought this would increase the amount of methane-eating bacteria in the water reducing the amount of methane released into the atmosphere as the ice melted. Instead, they found that the increased sunlight moving through the ice created the conditions for fewer of these bacteria to grow, allowing more methane to flow into the air because it isn't consumed by the methanotrophs. There are 9 million square miles of permafrost in the Arctic. As the Arctic continues to warm at more than twice the rate of lower latitudes, permafrost is getting warmer too. A deeper active layer brings more CO2 and more methane to the atmosphere. Scientists once believed that these gases were released only in summer months. They expected the natural processes that create methane to shut down in the brutal winter temperatures of the Arctic. In 2020, a paper was published revealing instead that snow falling in autumn on the vast Arctic tundra insulates the active layer. Methane continues to flow all winter. Methane from permafrost poses a significant problem for climate scientists. Figuring out just how much methane permafrost could contribute to global temperature rise has been a difficult task. 
Different conditions drive different outcomes. But one thing has become clear. Permafrost holds vast stores of methane, and in the warming Arctic, it is becoming a contributor to a warmer world, amplifying human-generated CO2 and methane. To keep the methane and carbon dioxide locked in permafrost, we need to change the energy with which we run our lives. Development of new oil and gas reserves brings only destruction and more emissions. We can drive and fly less. We can power our world from the sun and wind energy that are so abundant. We can reduce the amount of red meat we consume. We can throw less stuff away, particularly food waste, to keep our landfills as small as possible. If we all work toward a sustainable world in our daily choices, we can reduce the methane permafrost contributes to climate and avoid the permanent loss of this critical carbon sink. I'm gonna skip. Oh, there we go. Maybe skip too far. Let's not go quite that far. There. <laughs> okay. Um, since uh, 2020 turned out to be a year at home for most people, including the Arctic Arts team, I wanted to give you a sense of how we work by describing one of our expeditions from 2019. Uh, in April of 2019, uh, climatologist Jason Box from the University of Copenhagen released a meta-study spanning 47 years of data in nine key aspects of the Arctic system that have been altered by climate change. Uh, many of the changes documented in the study were particularly visible in the spring. So our group headed to Western Greenland in May to see what was happening there. Uh, we spent two weeks taking photographs and video in the areas around the Lulisat, uh, Disco Bay, Disco Island, and over the ice sheet uh, from Eki Glacier on down to the massive Jakobshavn Glacier. Um, what we experienced was one of the warmest springs on record for this region. Um, temperatures are usually around zero degrees Celsius in May. Uh, in June, the average temperature is 5.6 degrees. But we were wearing light jackets. Uh, the temperature was near 10 degrees most of the days and up to 16 on two days we were there. So spring came four weeks early that year and these temperatures had precisely the effect documented in the box study. In our explorations of the tundra, we found no snow remaining where normally there would still be light coverage and low temperatures, uh, keeping the plants dormant. So instead, the surface was covered with water-filled bogs, the plants were coming to life and many were blooming already. Um, there were no insects yet, and the unusual warmth triggers a shorter bloom cycle and then a mismatch between the plant's need for pollination and the arrival of the insects that do this work. So long-term, the result is far fewer species of plants in the tundra and a limited diet for animals like caribou and musk oxen who depend on them for food. And this was just one of the aspects of change the box study had quantified that we were able to document visually. Uh, later that summer, our team made expeditions to Northern Alaska, Svalbard, Norway, uh, Kulisut, Greenland on the East Coast, and another trip to Alulisat, Greenland on the West Coast. The team observed some dramatic and significant scenes that again played out many of the shifts in docu documented in that box study. Um, so 2019 was the warmest Arctic summer in recorded history. What greeted our team was unprecedented from anything we'd witnessed over the last decade. The Greenland ice sheet saw more than 200 million gigatons of fresh water melt that year. And at its peak, 65% of the ice sheet was in melt status. This had been modeled uh, by scientists to occur in the year 2070, yet it happened in 2019. 
Over the course of the summer, we witnessed significant permafrost collapse. Thermocarsts more than a meter deep and 100 meters long had formed where just a few weeks earlier, we'd photographed shallow wetland bogs. So permafrost covers more than 9 million square miles of the Arctic and the vast stores of carbon and methane in this ground have become vulnerable. Um, permafrost holds twice the amount of carbon sitting in known oil reserves and we really can't afford for it to be released into our atmosphere. Um, most of you are familiar with the news of wildfires across Greenland, Canada, Alaska, and Siberia. Um, sorry, my thing is getting in the way there. Um, a significant percentage of these fires occurred in permafrost regions where there are few or even no trees, but dried out peat moss and tundra instead. More than 6 million acres of the Arctic burned in 2019. And fire accelerates the rate of thaw dramatically, increasing the incidence of collapse and the development of thermokarst lakes. So here's a short film we made about permafrost in 2019. Um, yeah, there you go. So continuing on with some of the points Andrea was making about the Jason Box meta study, one of the key observations that we made both in early spring and throughout the summer in the Arctic was that the sea ice was vastly reduced from its normal coverage. In May, weeks ahead of the usual time, uh, fishermen that we were interacting with were out in boats laying long lines to catch halibut. And the fishermen that we spent time with had observed that the halibut have grown smaller over recent years. And this could be in part due to overfishing and in addition to the climactic changes. But yet as the sea ice or the sea is more free of ice, uh, more fish are caught up in the Arctic, at least until overfishing reduces that available catch. The Greenland fishermen we spent time with were pretty happy about this. They were making more money right now to buy things like bigger boats and snowmobiles and televisions. And they're able to put food on their table in the winter. So they're less concerned about the loss of caribou and musk oxen that people in more remote parts of the Arctic who depend on those animals for food all winter. Um, so as you know, the Arctic is warming much more than the rest of the planet due to polar amplification. And because it's so warm, the ice is not as thick and multi-year ice is in the very north is disappearing quite rapidly. We watched the last of the sea ice during our study in May disappear in Disco Bay as the temperature skyrocketed while we were there. I mean, it was, uh, like Andreas said, quite significantly warm. We're all aware of the melting ice sheet, but it's another to see it really happening. When we flew north from Alolostat to Eki Glacier, uh, our last visit to Eki 20 months before had us curious about how the glacier had changed during this time. 
Um, the glacier had not receded noticeably, but it had deflated markedly, leaving much of the rock exposed along the cliffs to flank it. But the most striking maybe uh, was as we flew over Eki up to the ice sheet, there were tracks and pools of deep blue water all over the surface of the glacier. The ice sheet, which in May should normally still be white, was similarly traced with blue. Every crack, every crevice held a river. Every depression held a lake. It was and is quite beautiful and yet very frightening to see so much blue water up there uh, in a time when we should still be seeing white. The observed feedback loop in Greenland is dramatically increasing the amount of water running from the ice sheet and into the oceans. Current studies are providing an understanding of how this fresh water affects the ocean currents, therefore winds, weather, and biosystems all around the planet. It's quite apparent that this increased melt volume and the time period is changing ecosystems on both land and in the water around Greenland. Earth's ice is on fire, and that is our newest film. Disappearing glaciers and ice sheets are retreating at a pace never predicted before. Some current studies indicate that the rate is nearly 40 times faster than previously modeled just five, 10 years ago, dramatically affecting freshwater supplies, ocean currents, ecosystems, and global weather patterns. We are all ice-dependent ice species, and we are all vulnerable right now. According to the United Nations, water use has grown at more than twice the rate of population increase over the last century. Nearly 2 billion people globally now depend on glaciers and snowmelt for drinking water and irrigation of crops. Global warming could reduce these outflows by 80% by the end of the century. The newest film, Ice on Fire, will journey to the ice sheets of our Antarctica and Greenland the world's high alpine glaciers from the Himalayas to the Andes, Rockies to the Alps, and the volcanic ice caps of Iceland. Presently, 10% of the land area on Earth is covered with glacial ice, including glaciers, ice caps, and ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica. Our team will be heading to Iceland in May to document some of the glaciers we have observed over the last 10 years. This decade has been one of significant change with some glaciers disappearing altogether throughout our warming world. And yes, on our trip to Iceland, we'll be shooting her newest volcano. Uh, this is some recent clips actually from two days ago from one of our team members up in Iceland uh, capturing the new volcano. So pretty epic stuff. <laughs> He did torch his drone getting this. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a bit of a shift there from volcanoes to ice. <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the Arctic is the key that unlocks our way of life here on Earth. If we allow this vulnerable system to fail, we set forth a cascade of changes everywhere reaching tipping points that may or may not be reversible, regardless of any action we take in the future. We now have annual average temperatures in the Arctic that are 2.7 degrees Celsius, higher than 40 years ago. The glaciers and ice sheet are diminishing far faster than anyone anticipated. And this meltwater has consequences to many systems, including human infrastructure. Permafrost is thawing, releasing methane and carbon dioxide from ancient reserves. Sea ice is disappearing and both land and marine ecosystems are changing rapidly. The indigenous population in this region is experiencing a boom where they fish and a bust where they hunt. It's hard to hear how much the Arctic is changing. We feel helpless to stop it and most people don't understand why it should mean anything to them. We see this change as a gift. In the Arctic, we're able to see firsthand how deeply a place can be altered by a warmer climate. And the Arctic is a sentinel telling us to move quickly to change the way we function on this planet 
to change the way we see this planet. It is not a thing with endless resources for us to squander. It is a living system made up of countless smaller living systems working together to create this beautiful habitable place. We have an opportunity and if we make the most of it by sharing the transformation we see in the Arctic and its relevance to people in other places, we just might be able to limit warming to something less than devastating for the rest of the world. I know all of you are and have been working to protect the natural world. We all know that we can change the way humanity does the work of living here. We can find a balance between our desire for comfort and convenience and our recognition that we must care for this fragile planet of ours. So there's not one solution, but many, and part of our work is to document and share potential solutions for mitigating global warming. The film on carbon capture and sequestration through growing existing forests is currently in the works as well. We interviewed scientists around the country who re have recently published work on what is our only option for carbon capture on a meaningful scale right now. That is our existing forests. We learned that planting trees has value, but would take at least two decades to begin pulling substantial amounts of carbon from the atmosphere. So the forests we have, particularly our public lands, are the best bet for rapidly reducing the carbon dioxide content of our air and beginning the arduous process of cooling this planet. Uh, we have a trailer for you. The film will be out um, this summer. So in a second, we have a trailer for you. Yeah, and I saw a comment on the chat asking if these films are available. Uh, most are available currently on our website and uh, this one will be soon. Yeah. Andrea, is there audio? Oh, that's right, the audio, hold on. I have to do one thing, I'm so sorry, you guys. This is my, this is my lameness for, I'm gonna stop sharing for one second and I'm gonna go to this one. I'm going to share a different screen, which has that. There we go. Okay, now you can see it and hear it. Right now, we need to lower the heat trapping gas content of the atmosphere and cool the Earth. growth of existing forests uh, in order to accumulate more carbon out of the atmosphere. We have no strategic plan to protect an intact network of nature that we need for everything to survive. This is, you know, where we can maximize carbon accumulation. It's where we can protect native biodiversity. It's where we can provide places for people that really need places they can count on to get away. So the fate of wild salmon in our country can't be separated from the fate of the forest. The forest controls the health of the watershed and the water. We have a climate emergency. We have a biodiversity emergency. We need to address both, and preserving more forest lands will do that. People are part of nature, and we need to get back into a relationship with nature that is much more mutually supportive. Uh, an ecological forest is what we're doing uh, is collaborating with nature for the benefit of both the forest ecosystem, and our society. Okay, now I can go back to the other one. I can't 
Yeah, sorry guys, that was a, that was one of our, oh wait, is it doing the right one? So, okay, so now we wanna skip this little bit. Okay, Carrie, back to you. All right, so um, we're just going to kind of do a wrap up. The Arctic Arts Project has really become a voice for science. Our work is deeply rooted in the current science. And we bring our voices of incredible filmmakers, photographers, visualists, each with his or her own unique perspective and vision, together with the hard work of dedicated science to share with the world what is changing and what we can do to protect the planet. We hope to offer hope rather than despair. Uh, this doesn't need to be depressing, though it may be in somewhat of that fashion. We hope to inspire action rather than helplessness. If you'd like to help us stay informed with the current scientific research that you're all doing, please get in touch with us after this talk. It's vital that we stay current with what's going on. And we know that there's thousands of studies going on, not only in the Arctic, but elsewhere around the world. And we'd love to be at the forefront of the latest science and bringing the stories and facts to life. Um, we'd love to answer any questions that you have right now about our work in this team. I've seen a couple questions arise already on the chat. Uh, feel free to chime in. And uh, Misty, if you wanna take control. If anyone wants to ask a question too, I think they just want to. Well, I just want to first comment that I mean I think this is uh, this is really showing how we're all on the same team. I mean, everyone at NSIDC, we're a positive force here on the planet, right? We're trying to contribute to solutions and understanding, as is Kerry and Andrea on what we're doing. Uh, I just want to really just to emphasize that. Uh, at NSIDC, we're doing the right thing. We like it. Yes, we do. Let's see. Oh, the film Not Okay was focused on glaciers. Yeah, I haven't seen that film, Not Okay. There's some great films out right now about the glacial loss in uh, Iceland. Was that, is that, was that film called Not Okay, Carrie, the one that you and I saw? Oh, the one, was it recent, Chris? Uh, Christopher Dunn uh, was Not Okay. Was that the one that showed the 50-year-old black and white aerials? It's 2019. I, I haven't seen it because I haven't been able to find it. I've, I've tried every source I can, and I'm just, I don't know if it's available except on in limited screenings that don't occur anymore. Uh, I don't want to drag the topic into that, but it was just, oh. it was just a little hope. Well, we just got word, and actually this one was released just in the last two months um, of a filmmaker that came out of Iceland working with the University of Iceland. And uh, it showed black and white aerials from 1950 to 19, I believe, 85. Um, and some satellite in there, but mostly it was aerials. And then they morphed with the current visuals of uh, ice loss in Iceland. And it was dramatic. And being up there for 10, 12 years, uh, Andrea and the rest of our team, obviously we have two members of the team that live there. Uh, we've seen dramatic changes uh, in Iceland alone, let alone Greenland and elsewhere. Uh -huh. um, Do you know one, the name of that film? We can get it for you. Um, and we may even post it on some notes from this uh, with Mestia so that she can send it out to everybody. I want to say it was on Netflix, wasn't it? I almost think it was. Or, yeah. and Netflix or Amazon, but yeah. We'll, we'll find it for you, Chris. Yeah. I, I know a new one came out called Meltdown, but I doubt that's the one. Mm, it wasn't that. I can't remember what it was called, but um, any other questions, thoughts? Hi, yeah, I'm a, a PhD student here at the University of Colorado, and I wanted to thank you for 
your work. I've been long interested in, in the intersection of art and science. And so I think seeing this is really wonderful. I was curious if you guys had been in contact with any native um, communities in the Arctic regions or polar regions that you've been involved with and how you've incorporated your interactions with them into your work. Um, short answer, yes, without a doubt. Um, from Nunavut to Sami, uh, a lot of involvement in the Greenlandic Inuit, both East and West Coast. Um, Law school? Sorry. And, and great interactions um, just by living on the ice with uh, the indigenous. So one of the things that we work specifically is to not try and get something from the indigenous but really be with the indigenous no matter where we're at to really understand their plight, their struggles, uh, how a changing lifestyle might affect them greatly. Um, you know, we've seen dramatic changes specifically on the east coast of Greenland where you're a hunter fish society and it's gone um, or for the most part gone. And what does a society do? What, what becomes their economic driver and what becomes their psychological driver? Who are they? And uh, so uh, we are also working uh, with a filmmaker out of Nunavut uh, to uh, fund a expedition in 2022 that Andrea will be leading for women and indigenous um, that we're very excited about, so. Yeah. Great, thank you for clarifying. Um, I have a comment. My name is Florence, and um, I found, um, for me, the most effective uh, piece of what you showed was uh, when you were talking about Jason, Jason Box's study, the meta study, mm -hmm. and um, and then basically you came back and mentioned that study every now and then, but you you uh, interspersed that with a lot of doc, you know photographic documentation of what the study found and. For me, the study sort of gave me a through line for, for this. Maybe it was easier for me to pay attention and focus because you kept coming back to this, this study. You know, he found this, they found this, look, it's here. So mm -hmm. I, I just think that's a particularly effective way to do what you're doing. That was a lucky one. We don't always get a fabulous um, meta study like that that's covering um, exactly what we're looking at. Um, most of the time we put together uh, pieces, um, you know, around methane or uh, permafrost or whatever, um, based on the science that uh, we find, uh, research we do, usually a scientist will, will bring us something and be like, hey, have a look at this. And um, we try to put it together into something cohesive. Sometimes that works better than others. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Interesting. Yeah. Florence, great comment. Thanks. Um, it really resonates with us when we get scientists that have something that speaks to them uh, that we're able to put into a visual mode. Uh, this key indicator study we presented in Brussels to the IUCN, and it was wonderful to get feedback from that same kind of platform where. Uh, you were connecting both the laity of the world and the science of the world and trying to mesh them into a, a unified understanding of something. I have a follow-up question for you guys. Um, if, so if, so, one, if a scientist at NSIDC had an idea for a so, on something that they're passionate about and they care about, if they were to approach you, what would what would you want to know? Um, well, basically, the we'd love to see the primary research. I mean, that's one of our things. And then it's wonderful when we can talk with the scientists who did the work. Um, generally, we like things that fit uh, with other science that's also happening. So, you know, if you bring us something that's really interesting and quite um, pertinent, right, to what's happening now, we will try to go find the other pieces that kind of fit and round that, round that story out. 
Um, so if you know those, that's always great. But really, I mean, we love to see and just have a chat about the research that's going on. And, um, you know, we're in conversation with a couple of scientists who are working on um, ocean currents and how those are changing uh, with the freshwater influx, particularly from Eastern Greenland. Um, that research isn't complete. Uh, so, you know, we're not ready to like move forward in a specific way in, in terms of film, but it's so great to keep in touch with them and find out, you know, how it's going uh, until it's published. So we do like it to be published because, uh, you know, we will take a fair amount of flack at times on online or whatever. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, we have fully supported, um, you know, peer reviewed work, essentially. Well, yeah, and one other point, we're working on this Ice on Fire film, and ironically, we thought we had a pretty good handle on permafrost and working on what that ice looks like and you know what the permafrost and the tundra looks like. And then all of a sudden, we're talking to a couple scientists, and there's this reveal that permafrost is in high alpine rock. It's in high alpine soils and you've got mountains that are calving off because of permafrost collapse at high alpine regions, both in the Alps and in the Himalayas. And this is just emerging science, but it's connecting more dots than we thought previously. And so to have somebody from NSIDC or NSTAR or NASA that is pulling a piece of data that is really profound and relevant may connect to a whole bunch of other things that we're already working on. Yeah, and if you guys are excited about it, then we probably will be too. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. If nobody else has any other questions, my final question for you guys is, um, what, how did you both get into this? How did you both um, decide to combine art and you know, the Arctic? Well, Carrie, you should start that. <laughs> okay. Um, I graduated a long time ago in environmental design from CU. And so I've had this core belief that um, environment ties everything together. And uh, I've also been photographer and communicator for a long time. And uh, so that passion was always inherent in what I did. And I shot travel photography for many, many years. Um, but again, searching for a purpose some 10, 15 years ago that put us beyond just shooting pretty pictures. Um, and so I was actually climbing Denali and um, not with the intention of summiting, but with the intention of photographing Denali. And we came across what proved to be polygon hummocks. And you saw it in the film, there was these beautiful mounds on Foraker Ridge uh, that we had no idea what we were looking at. And it turned out to be permafrost melt um, at 12,000 feet. And that was a little daunting, but it was also the answer to what I had been looking for to begin this connection between art and science that we could put the visuals to something that people didn't understand. And, um, Andrea has just got an amazing science and visual mind, and I'll let you tell them why you're into it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've, I've been very interested in the, well, the science and actually the art of human impact on the planet um, for 30 some odd years. Uh, I, I, it's just a fascinating process watching how humanity interacts with uh, our one and only world. Um, and I've made art about that. Uh, I was a painter and sculptor primarily, but have always done photography as well. And I've traveled uh, an enormous amount. And I particularly uh, kind of more adventurous travel to remote places because um, that appeals to me a lot. Um, and uh, on one of those trips, I happened back in 2014, um, I decided I needed to get the hell out of Dodge and 
uh, signed up for a photo tour, which I had never done before with a guy I had never heard of, Yuri Velagorshi, who uh, is an amazing photographer. But I was like, I want to go to Greenland. And that's a hard one to plan on your own. Like there, you can't just get a car and cruise around. So uh, I met Carrie on that trip. It was also his first uh, time to that area. And we just hit it off. We, it, we would just find that, you know, we'd be off wandering and we ended up talking and uh, I joined the Arctic Arts Project shortly after that because that suits also my desires, you know, for meaning and, and purpose that way in my work. So it's been a great partnership and now we've made it a nonprofit and we've started doing much more film and all these things. So, yeah. But there are eight collaborators, eight photographers and filmmakers who work consistently, regularly with us. They're all very well known internationally and amazing, amazing um, visualists. And then we also have, oh, probably a dozen and a half, two dozen uh, contributors, people who will bring us work from a specific, um, you know, a trip or whatever. Uh, and share that with us, which is often quite impressive as well. So we get it from everywhere. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for everything you both are doing. And thank you for presenting at, here today for NSIDC. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having us. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you all for joining us. And uh, it's really an honor to present to the science world. Uh, we always love this piece of it. Yep. Well, thank you. This has been great. This has been great. Real loyal. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.